that was a blessing. Amen. 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 And that's what we should all say. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me. Well, friends, it is a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord today. And as I was saying earlier, it looked like we dodged a bullet and it's uh, when our weather stayed away from us for the most part. But any day that we can come together is a blessed day. Amen? Yes. Amen. And we can get up and we can come here and we can fellowship in freedom and in truth. And today we're going to be coming to the end of our journey through Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia. So as we take a look back at some of the issues and points that Paul brought to light, hopefully it will inspire us today in our Christian walk. And so as we start to look back at some of the different points that we've looked at over these past several weeks is this. Number one is that the central message of the letter to the Galatian church is spiritual freedom and deliverance that can only be found in Christ Jesus. In other words, you can't find spiritual freedom anywhere else. Hard as you try. You can't find deliverance from sin and guilt and oppression, you can't find it in anywhere except through Jesus Christ. And so this letter truly encapsulates the five solas of the Reformation that we talked about. In other words, we had sola gratia, sola fide, solus Christos, soli Deo Gloria, and sola scriptura, which translates salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, according to the scripture, the authority of of the scriptures alone. And though in our pluralistic society today, many claim that we need to quote unquote coexist. You'll see it on license plates, t-shirts, bumper stickers, you'll see all these different things. Coexist. However, their definition is radically different than what we would classify as coexist. In other words, as Christians, we're actually, we are commanded to live peaceably with other people. I don't know if you know that, but that's what we're commanded to do. We are to be at peace with everyone. Matter of fact, Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, he puts it this way. He says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So in that aspect, we would say, yes, we need to coexist. We need to coexist. Where we would say, Though that you're, you may be wrong in your beliefs, we can genuinely tell someone that, that, that they're wrong, they're incorrect. We don't bring hate or violence to the table. We don't do that. We don't hate anyone. I can disagree with you, but it doesn't mean that I hate you. I can disagree with you and actually love you. As a matter of fact, true love, true love will speak the truth. True love will let someone know when they're in error. You won't let them walk in in incorrectness, if you will. So the world's definition is different, though, than our definition. The world says this. The world says in order to coexist, you have to agree with me. In order to coexist, your, all everyone's views have to conform to everybody else's views, and don't you dare think differently. Because if you think differently, then, then, then you're, you're hateful, then you're a racist, then you're a bigot if you disagree. You might testify they've heard that. Mm -hmm. Amen. So they also would say this, that if you don't agree with me, then you're my enemy and I have to stop you at all costs. I have to stop you from talking and, and pretty much from existing to the point of even maybe imprisonment and death. The current coexist movement demands that we see all religious beliefs as equal and valid. That they're all the same, basically. They would say that we all worship the same God. We just do it in different ways. We just go about it in different ways. Mm -mm. But is that true? No. Is that even logic? Uh, is that even a logical position to take? No. Nope. I would say no. I would agree. We looked at just twelve, if you remember, just twelve of the world's different religions to show that actually they're not the same. We they're all actually radically different in what they teach and in what they believe. And friends, what you believe, what you put your faith in, what you're trusting in, has life or death consequences. Here now, and also eternally speaking. In the book of Genesis, Moses recorded the account of when God had brought his fierce wrath and judgment upon an evil in a wicked world, if you remember. Finding only one righteous man, Noah, God commanded him to build a large boat. God provided only one way to be saved. Only one way. If you had obeyed the call and you had entered through the door that was provided for you, you would have been saved. You would have been saved. 
And today Jesus reaffirms this command in John chapter 10, verse 9, where he, re he reveals, he says, I am that door, he says. Anyone who enters by me, he will be saved. And it's this, this is the main point. This is the good news. This is the gospel. In other words, Paul writes to remind the readers that there is only one way to be made right with our Creator God, and that should be good news. That should be encouraging because if, if, we, if there truly were many ways and we didn't know what way was the right way, and they say this, and they say this, and they say that, and we believe this, but what way is the right way? If, if that was really the truth, that they're all just the same, then that would be like looking for that proverbial needle in a haystack. How do we know what way? But praise God, he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There is but one way. Turn over in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, turn over to Acts chapter 17. We'll be looking at verse number 22. Amen when you're there. Acts 17, verse 22. And we think about this is can really be us today standing in front of our co-workers, our friends, our family members, society that is in disbelief and has this coexist mindset about it. Acts 17, starting at verse 22. Dr. Luke records this, says that Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription. It says, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, it's him that I proclaim to you. You see, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he is made from one blood, every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord, in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something that's been shaped by, by art and man's devising. But truly, these times of ignorance God has overlooked. But now, now He commands all men everywhere to repent because He has appointed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. And He has given us assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. And this is the point that Paul is driving home. This is the point that he's trying to make to the church in Galatia because they're having all these questions and answers and all these false teachers that though the world will tell you that there are many ways, the world will tell you that there are many paths. You just have to try to figure it out. Many paths to God, many ways to God. Jesus Christ, the second member of the triune Godhead, declares in John 14, 6 that He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And then he says that nobody, no one, comes to the Father except through Him. And you know, I wanted to do a word study. I thought, well, what does he really mean whenever it says here, no one? And so I thought, well, I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. I want to find out. It was written in Greek. I want to find out what did he mean by that. So if we look at that word for no one in the Greek, it's actually one word, we're going to discover something very amazing. The word for no one is udais, udais. And you know what that word literally means? It means no one. Nobody. No one. Not even one. So what Jesus is saying whenever he says that nobody comes to the Father except through him, what he really means by that is nobody comes to the Father except through him. So it means it exactly the way he says it. There is no mistranslation there. Nobody comes to the Father except through Him. So if somebody says, how do I get to God? Jesus. Well, well, how do I please God? Jesus. How are my sins going to be removed? Jesus. Well, well, how can a holy and a just and a righteous God possibly forgive somebody like me? You don't know what I've done. Somebody that's wicked and wretched and vile. How can He forgive a sinner like me? 
Church, what's the answer? Jesus. It's Jesus. That's the answer. And as, it's just as the angel of the Lord had spoke to Joseph. If you remember back in Matthew chapter 1, he said this, You shall call his name Yeshua. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Let's pray. Father God, today as we go into your word, as we look into the, the scripture today, as we close out this, this amazing letter that you had Paul write to the Galatian church, Father, we pray that we learn much today, that we pray, Father, that these seeds of your word will fall into good, fertile soil, that our hearts will be plowed up, our minds will be plowed up today, Lord, and that the seeds that fall in, not only will they fall in, but they will take root, Lord, and then they, they will reap a mighty harvest one day, they will produce much fruit today. And so, Father, we praise you, we thank you, and we love you for speaking to us through your word. And we give you praise and honor in Christ Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So again, let's, let's look at what Paul's saying. Number one, the, the number one central message is this, that there is no other gospel. There is no other way. Jesus is the answer to all of your questions. He's the answer. Salvation comes only by God's grace not by works. In other words, you can't earn it and you certainly don't deserve it. And I'm speaking for me. It's by grace alone that we're given this, this, this offer of salvation. So number one, there is no other way. There's one gospel, one Christ. Number two, that the law, the law that was given is what's called our pedagogos, if you remember that word that we talked about. That word means our schoolmaster, our guardian. But that word is, is very specific. Remember in the Greek and Roman world that families would, would have a slave, that they would, a, a trusted slave, who then I would say, listen, I, I want you to, to guard my son. I want you to raise him up. I want you to, to I want to train him up in, in obedience and in discipline. I want, you to, I want you to take him to and from school. You're going to be his guardian and his guide. And that's what this slave would do, this pedagogos. He would also be in charge of scolding and whipping in charge of discipline if it became necessary. So in other words, this role though of, of Pythagogos as tutor and schoolmaster, it, it was not a permanent role. It served as, as, the, as the boy was a child. And then one day this, this capacity as, as guardian, the child grew into an adult, that role would change. The slave was no longer over him. But now they could be almost seen as, as friends now. That the role of, of guardian and steward now is we are now friends with each other because now I've reached a certain age. I'm no longer a child. I'm no longer underneath you. And that's the message that Paul was trying to write because he says in Galatians 3.24, he says, therefore the law was our, our tutor. He used that word was our pedagogos to bring us to Christ. And they would have understood that immediately. Whenever the Greek readers, when they would have heard that in Galatian church, I know what a pedagogos. I had a pedagogos when I was a child. They'd have been thinking. They would have understood. That's what the law was to us. They would have known that. So they, he's trying to help them understand what their now their relationship to the law is. You're no longer under the law as a schoolmaster. But before our regeneration, before our salvation, we were as little children under the strict guidance and the watchful eye of the law to help us know what is right from wrong. You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. You shall have no other gods before you. You shall not commit adultery. So as helping them understand, you shall not, you shall not, you shall not. But then when Christ comes into your life and, he, and you're regenerated, you're born again in the Spirit, His Spirit comes to live within you, God writes His law upon your heart. So now you don't have to just sit underneath the law. You don't have to just go, how, how do I please God? What do I do? God's written that upon your heart and upon your mind, upon your conscience. So the law originally just served as a mirror that we could look at to see our true self before the Savior. We could see that we, we needed a Savior. That's what it reveals to us. And that our own power, I can't keep that law. If I try to keep it, I can't do it in my own power. And that's the purpose of it. To let us know that we fall short, that we need rescuing. We need a Savior. But I, I want to please God on my own. I think I can do it. I think I can do a good job. I think that I can earn my own salvation. If you think that, the law reveals to you that, well, in order to do that, you have to keep every single bit of it, every jot, every tittle. And not only do you have to keep it, you have to keep it in thought, in word, and in deed. And you have to have done it from birth until this very moment that you're breathing. 
never stumbling, not mm -hmm. even once. That's what you have to do to earn it on your own. So the law doesn't help us, it leaves us helpless. The law drives us to the foot of the cross. It leads to that point where we reach up, we see Christ on the cross, we grab those blood-stained, pierced feet of Jesus, and we cry out, What must I do to be saved, Lord? I am undone. I am unworthy. What do I have to do? That's the point. That's what the law drives us to do. And then when you're saved, when you're redeemed, whenever you're regenerated in your spirit, the law becomes our friend. It now becomes our companion. It, it comes along beside us, helping us through the Holy Spirit to know how to live that holy life. You see, before, I didn't mind lying. Before, I wouldn't have thought second about stealing or looking with lust or pornography or whatever. That kind of stuff wouldn't bother me. But when I'm saved and I'm born again, the Spirit's work doing its job within me now. I want to be set apart. I want to live a righteous life. And the law is our companion and it helps us to know how to do that. It helps me to know not to lie. I don't want to lie. Not steal, not look with lust, not do these things. And keep God first. That's the point of the law. And so, number one, when we hear and understand the central message of salvation, that it's through grace alone, not of works. And number two, that when we've been brought to Christ by the law, by the Pythagogos, our schoolmaster, then we come to number three, and that's we begin to live like Christ. We begin to live in Christ. Our walk and our talk start to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and our, and our heart. Old things pass away. All things become new. We are what the Bible refers to as a new creation. You're not who you once were. People you may have gone to school with, they meet you and you're like, you're different. What's different about you? Why aren't you participating in the stuff at work that everybody else participates in? They're cussing and drinking and, and going to the bars and the clubs and all these things, and you don't do that kind of stuff. Why is that? Why is that? Why do you talk different? I've never heard you utter a curse word my, the whole time I've been around you. I've never heard you talk bad about anybody. I've never heard you gossip. There's something different about you. What is it? The Lord Jesus living with inside me. You see, that's what he wants to do. He wants to transform us to look more like Christ. It's easy to look like the world. It's easy to do that kind of stuff. The Christian walk is not an easy walk. Therefore, we have to let Christ do that work for us and through us. So whenever we're born again and all things have become new or that new creation, that's where the Bible talks about we have to crucify the lusts and passions of the flesh. Anybody that was crucified didn't want to be crucified. They didn't want that. And that's when the Bible says we have to crucify the flesh. We may want to do those things that our flesh craves, but we have to crucify it, take it captive and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I may want to watch that on TV, but I'm not going to do it. I may want to listen to this, or I may want to do that, but I'm not going to do it because I'm going to crucify my flesh. I'm going to live to Christ. And God, even though that the temptations are overwhelming, I pray that you'll give me the strength to resist. And if you pray that prayer, God will help you. We have to surrender, though, to his will and to his leading. We have to do that. We're, whenever we do that, whenever we surrender to him, and we, and we stay in his word. We pray. We resist temptation. We cut off those things that might drag us down. Or even cut off people that might drag us down. Then we're free. We're free to truly love. To agapeo, as the Bible says. It's that loving the unlovable. That person that I look at and I can't stand them. Now I'm free to really love them because I turned that over to Christ. And I'm commanded to do that. It's not an option. We have to love people. Even those people that we just can't stand to hear their voice. It's like nails grating on a chalkboard. Does anybody have that? Anybody like that in their life ever? That people we got to love. We have to love them because Christ loved us. Hold your place uh, in the Bible. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to show you what that should look like. What should it look like to truly love someone? 1 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 13, starting at verse number 4. Amen when you're there. So, Pastor, I'm, I'm trying to live in the Spirit. I'm, I'm reading my Scriptures, and I'm praying, and, and, and I'm praying to God that He keeps me out of temptation. I want to love people. What should that look like? Paul writes forth. He lets us know. 1 Corinthians 13, starting at verse 4. Look how he describes it. 
love suffers long. Love is kind. You know, love doesn't envy. Love doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Love is not provoked and it thinks no evil. You know, love does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. <coughs> love bears all things and it believes all things and it hopes all things. Look what else it says it does. It endures all things. As Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, for all of the law, all of it, every single bit of it is fulfilled in one word, even in this, that you shall love, you shall agape your neighbor as yourself. If we truly love as Christ first loved us, if we, if we can love this way, we don't keep record of, of wrongs, we endure, we hope, we believe, we trust, we rejoice, we don't parade it around. If we do that, if we love this way, if we invest in others' lives, if we do that, if we see a brother or sister in sin, if we, we see the warning signs are there that they're starting to wander off the path, we're compelled by our love for them. We're also com ultimately compelled for our love for God to try and restore them to the faith. Our love will compel us to do that. And as saints of God, it's our sacred duty to do that. Not just mine as we talked about, but as you are saints as we talked about. It's our duty. We're in this together. It's not an us versus them. And throughout this letter, Paul teaches, he, ex he teaches us, he exhorts us, he admonishes us, and yes, he even rebukes at some points. Look down at our scripture for today, if you're in Corinthians, turn ahead two books, you go through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, you come to Galatians and we'll be at our scripture for today. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 11. Amen when you're there. Amen. 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 All right, Galatians 6, turn to verse 11. Paul says, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So as we start to unpack this, we look at verse 11. He says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Why did Paul write that? Well, there's a couple of theories about maybe why he included that, why he said that. Number one could have been poor eyesight. Some scholars believe that Paul's thorn in the flesh, if you remember him talking about, could have been maybe like a macular degeneration where he couldn't see and they didn't have spectacles back then. Right now you all became very blurry. So, I'll put this back on. <laughs> so that might have been the issue that Paul had this thorn in flesh that he prayed, Lord, take this, this cursed vision away from me that I, I can't see. I need, I need to be able to see. So that might have been one reason why he put that. See with what large letters that I'm writing so he could see it. Another clue that gives us about that was back in Galatians 4, verse 15, where he said, What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So see how that maybe kind of ties together. So that's possibly why he wrote that. Number The second possible reason could be that normally whenever Paul's letters were written, he would have a scribe. He would have someone that would write it, take dictation basically. Paul would be speaking and this person would dictate for him. But, so maybe he's showing here that, listen, I'm writing this with my own hand to show you how important this message really is. And I'm even writing it in big letters so you'll know it was me. And then maybe there's a third perhaps to show that the letter really was from Paul. You see, back then also, people were writing letters and things and claiming to be writing this for the apostle. Well, I, I'm coming to you because Peter sent me, or, or I'm writing this to you because Paul said it, or John said it. And so here, Paul's letting them know, listen, this really is me, this writing this. This is not some foreign stuff. So when the Judaizers and the false teachers try and tell you that 
that wasn't me, I'm letting you know now it is me. So maybe it's one of these three, maybe it's none of those three reasons. Maybe it's all three together why he wrote that. But it just lets us know, whatever the reason is, Paul's showing his divine God-given authority over the church body as a shepherd of the flock. He's letting you know, I'm putting my seal of approval on it. And in the section, he launches, in this section, if you notice, he's launching one final attack against the false teachers, against the satanically inspired wolves who sought to devour the brothers and sisters. And ultimately, that's what it is. If somebody is being a false teacher, that only comes from Satan. Satan wants to divide the brethren. That's what he wants to do. He wants to come cause mumblings and grumblings and get our eyes off of the prize. That's what he wants to do. And so this satanically inspired attack against the church, Paul is just writing one final attack against them. And in verses 12 to 13, Paul reveals their motives. He reveals their hearts of the Judaizers. He shows that actually, actually, they're prideful. Actually, they're cowards, and actually, they're hypocrites. And here it is, and look at the scripture. Verse 12, the first part, he says, Those who try to make a good showing in the flesh, this is appealing to their pride. They weren't trying to please God with an, with an inward righteousness, but they were more worried about being seen by their works. In other words, they were like, hey, look what I did. Look at me. Hey, 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 yeah, don't look at that over there. But look at how good I'm doing. Look how amazing I am. Look what I can do. Instead of pointing them to God, they were pointing to themselves. That should have been a first flag right there. You see, they see themselves as good. They see themselves as, as righteous. But it's not because of what Christ had done for them, but because of their own deeds. Church, we have to guard our hearts and our minds that we don't fall into this sin. It'd be easy to fall into that sin, wouldn't it? You do that so well. You, you do this excellently. Wow! You are so amazing! It'd be easy to just go, oh yeah, you're right. Wow, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> but we should never do that. All glories to God. Somebody tells you you did a great job. Say, Praise the Lord. Thank you. So you, you automatically turn it back to God. I can't do anything outside of Christ. If you have any gift, any ability, anything at all, even the breath in our lungs, praise God. Praise God. But they weren't doing that. They wanted to glory in their own flesh. Look what I've done. Look how amazing that I am, they said. And so we have to guard ourselves. That's a warning for us, to guard our hearts and our minds. Always check our motives because all glory belongs to God alone. Remember that sola, soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. Remember what our Lord's words were in Luke chapter 17, verse 10. When I read this for the first time years ago, it really struck me. Luke 17, 10, Jesus said this, When you've done, when you have done all the things which you are commanded to be done, you should say only this, We are unprofitable servants. We have done only what was our duty to do. That should be our attitude. I'm nothing special. I'm nobody, I'm nobody good. I'm nobody special. I've only done Lord, what you've asked me to do. And I am unprofitable. He gets nothing out of it. But I get everything from him. And so they were prideful. But then Paul also points out, you know what? They were also cowards. Look at the other part of verse 12, what he says. These same ones would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Did you know that following Jesus just might cost you something? Did you know that? You know, there's a reason why he said, pick up your cross and follow me. We're told that to follow him, we are to count the cost. In other words, we're, we're to look at it, we're to investigate what the scriptures say. Is it worth it to me? I could lose my family, I could lose my friends, I could lose my job, I could lose my home, and maybe even my very own life. Is it worth it? Christ's words, count the cost. Is it worth it to you? The Judaizers, they wanted to live in two worlds. You see, they taught that you had to be, you had to be circumcised to be saved. Well, that's great that you've repented and you're trusting in, in the grace, but you also have to be circumcised. You have to do this as well, or you won't be one of God's children. They were saying Christ's sacrifice wasn't enough. And not only were they teaching this perversion of the truth, 
They did it out of compromise. You see, times aren't like they are now. In first century A.D., if you were a follower of the way, which is what they didn't call it Christianity back then, they called it the way because Jesus said he is the way, if people knew that you were a follower, they would shun you. They saw you in the street, they would go out of their way to walk around you. They weren't to talk to you. You would be publicly mocked. You'd be publicly ridiculed. You'd be spat upon. They'd see you as a blasphemer. And so to protect their status, to protect their egos, to protect their material possessions, because people also, they weren't supposed to buy and sell. Oh, you're one of those people that follows Jesus. Okay, well, I can't sell my stuff to you. I'm not going to do that. Well, I, I need to sell this to you then because I need money. Well, I'm sorry, I can't buy that from you. You're a blasphemer. And so they really had to take care of themselves as followers. That's why you see in the scriptures that they're to share with each other because the rest of the world didn't want anything to do with them. And so the Judaizers, they said, you know what? We're going to say it's Christ plus this. That way we can kind of ride that fence and we can still have our glory. We can still go into the temple. We can still go to the synagogue. We can still fellowship with family and friends that would have normally sheltered us. They say, oh, no, 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 no. We're saying that you also have to keep the law. You have to do all this stuff too. We're not rejecting any of that stuff. And so they're saying Christ wasn't enough. They were stressing the outward signs of the covenant. Because they want to avoid persecution for standing up for the truth. But friends, the closer you draw to God, the closer you draw to the truth. You've got to hang on to the truth. And the closer you grow, you grow to God and to the truth, you're growing closer to the light. And you know something about the light? The darkness hates the light. And what does the light do? It exposes things. It, it chases away the darkness. Hold your place here in Galatians and turn back to John chapter 3. See what Jesus says about that. John chapter 3, starting at verse 19. Amen when you're there. Amen. John 3. Look what Jesus says. He says, And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. So look what it says. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he that does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. So not only were they prideful, not only were they cowardly, excuse me, but they were ultimately hypocrites. We're back in Galatians 6 now, looking at verse 13. It says this, For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your own flesh. The Judaizers may have been circumcised, but they did not hold to the law of Moses. They really didn't do it. They only wanted to boost their own fame by showing how many disciples they had. These Judaizers were no better than the hypocritical Pharisees and Sadducees and, and scribes that Jesus encountered. Again, hold your place. We're going to go backward in time again to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. Starting at verse 13. Amen. When you're there. Matthew 23. Amen. Amen. And so here's how Jesus dealt with people that were hypocritical and cowards and prideful. Matthew 23, starting at verse 13. Look how Jesus talks. He says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says, You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says, For you devour widows' houses. For a uh, pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. And woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, but when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, Whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. Whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. 
fools and blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the mightier weights of the law. Justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. And so what Christ is saying and what he says to us today and what Paul was saying then is that God is not interest in, interested in your pious outward expression of religion until the inside of the cup is cleansed. Because you notice what Jesus said as he's rebuking them. Look what he said at the end of verse 23. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So all the other things, yes, you should do. But you've got to do the important things first. In other words, he wants the inside of the cup cleansed. You can make the outside as pretty as you want it, but if the inside is full of muck and grime and sin and dead men's bones, God's got to deal with that first. And Jesus said in Matthew 7, how can you say to your brother, let me get that speck out of your eye when you have a plank in your own eye? He said, here's what you have to do. First, remove the plank from your eye and then you will see clearly how to remove the speck from your brother's eye. First, take care of your own heart and then you will see how to do that. People like to say, and you may have heard it, hey, you're not supposed to judge. Judge not. You know what your scripture says? Next time somebody says that, say yes, but continue in that verse and see what it says. Because after he says, judge not lest you be judged. For how can you say to your brother, remove the speck from your eye when you have a plank in your own eye? First remove the plank from your own eye. Then you will see clearly how to help your brother remove that speck from his eye. Pride, cowardice, and hypocrisy were the underlying motives of the false teachers. That was their underlying motives. And ultimately, you know, that's satanically inspired. And friends, we need to examine our hearts to make sure that our motives are pure before a holy God. Look back at Galatians chapter 6. We're going to finish it out. Galatians 6, starting at verse 14 now. Paul writes, But God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So here Paul concludes this amazing letter reminding the church that we glory only in Christ. We glory only in what He has done. And, and our standing before God is the most important subject that we can possibly undertake. That's the most important subject for us. So in other words, if you're not born again, if you haven't gotten past step number one, nothing else matters. Don't worry about all the other stuff. Don't worry about trying to build up your brother, hold up your brother, do all those things. If you're not past step one, if you're not born again, you got to get right with God first. You remember whenever you're on an airplane and you're flying and the stewardess is, is, is giving you the instructions on what to do if the cabin loses pressure in the air and the uh, oxygen mask come down, what's the first thing you're supposed to do? Put yours on first. Put yours on first. Then you can help other people. You're no use to somebody if you black out. And you're no use to somebody. You're no use to God if you're not right with Him. So you've got to get right with God first. That's step one. Nothing else matters. There's only justice in, found in Jesus. There is only hope found in Jesus. There is only redemption found in Jesus. There is only peace in Jesus. And then he finishes it here in verses 16 to 18. And as many as walk according to this rule, all this we've just talked about, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. You know, Though Paul's body was broken, his body was torn, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, his hope never left him. And if you're a new creation, if you're living and walking and growing in holiness, then listen to God's words. He says this in the Scriptures, Peace and mercy be upon you. Peace and mercy be upon you. 
you who have been adopted into spiritual Israel. He says this, you who are slaves of the flesh, you who are slaves of the world and of the devil, you have been set free now. You have been set free from all that. And so then Paul concludes, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much, Lord, for the grace and the mercy that you have shown to us, a sinful people. People that would have never on our own sought you out. You sought us first. We thank you for that. Help us never take that for granted, Lord. Help us to walk every day growing closer and closer to you. Help us crucify the flesh. Help us to shun the worldly influences, Lord, that we may keep our eyes focused on you, whether it's people, whether it's work, whether it's our own minds and hearts, whatever it is, Lord, that seeks to draw us away from you, to take our eyes off of you, Lord. Keep us on that path, Lord, because the things of this world will pass away. And one day, Lord, each and every one of us will stand alone before you to give an account of our lives, Lord Jesus. And we'll either see you as our Redeemer and our Savior, or we'll see you as our Judge. And so, Father, I pray today that everyone that hears my voice knows you as their Savior, Lord. But most of all, I pray that you know them as your children, as your spiritual Israel. And so, Father God, we praise you today. We thank you today. We love you today. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus.